So, um, as you can tell, my name is Kevin. Um, I'll, well, I'm from Conversocial, and I'll be taking you tonight through uh, a few thoughts that um, we've had at Conversocial and the Crowds team over the past three years working on atypical uh, B2B2C. And first of all, thank you very much for turning up. I know that early January is not the happiest and most you know, energetic part of the year, so it's quite the turnout, and I appreciate it. So, um, a little bit about me first. So, as I said, I'm a product manager at Conversocial. Just hands up, anyone familiar with Conversocial? <laughs> if you're not working at Conversocial, so just the one. Uh, yeah. And um, so, I'm a product manager at Conversocial. What we do is uh, uh, customer support software for people, companies who engage with their customers through social media channels. So, we We've got a, a variety of products, uh, you know, and we, we help brands uh, be present on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and a wide variety of things. And at Cover Social, I am a product manager for a product called Crowds, which I'll get into a little bit in, in a second because it's, it's a bit of a different beast. But what you should know about me is my background's in product management and community management. I started in community management uh, a while back in the video games industry where my job was basically to get people to be happy and play nice when really they were angry all the time and busy killing each other. So that gave me kind of an insight as to how to create group dynamics and maybe um, help me work out a way to have people work towards goals in a way that is fun for them but does not in, uh, involve a direct um, hierarchy with the people that they're interacting with. So I thought I'd start with this because I think it's a terrible, terrible definition. Uh, took it from Techopedia, sorry if anyone's from Techopedia. Uh, but B2B to C, what's B2B to C? Business to business to consumer is an e-commerce model that combines business to business and business to consumer for a complete product or service transaction. Which is all cool, That's, that was probably very, very accurate 10 years ago. But in the meantime, uh, a few things have uh, come along where you can have a B2B to C um, system or model but that does not include or, or um, selling stuff to people in, in any way, shape or form. So what I would like to uh, just uh, you to remember is the second part of this definition from Techopedia is it's a, col a collaboration process that in theory creates mutually beneficial service and products. They, thought it, they think product delivery channels is important, I don't, but just for the sake of clarity there it is. So crowds, uh, what is crowds? As I said, it's a bit of a different beast. The mouthful definition of crowds is that it's community-powered peer-to-peer social resolution on Twitter. So that's the one sentence. It probably doesn't mean much to you right now. So um, in a nutshell, what it is, is this. Imagine you're a company, uh, let's say a, a big tech company, and you've got loads of people on Twitter who've got problems, and you want to, uh, uh, to find a way to interact with those people. And we're not talking about people who are reaching out to you, we're talking about the average person who might be going, ah, uh, oh, why doesn't this work? This is, you know, such and such company's product is the worst. Right now, you've got no, very few ways of interacting with these people. Well, what we do, what Crowds does, is work with the brand to define what kind of content they want to find on Twitter. So, for example, a number of searches that will say, well, we want to pull in questions that include these terms, do not include these terms in that language, and so on and so on. And once we do that, we start, we turn on the engine and crowd start putting in content, giving it a good shake, and then finding the relevant content, the good questions, the things that people can help with. So taking the questions from this guy and giving it to a group of people that uh, are the crowd's users and which we call experts, who are people who are attached to your brand in some way but do not work for you. So they're your brand advocates. They are people who are really into what you do. And that way, you can address those, um, those problems at scale very easily and in a way that's very organic and simple. So of course, it's not if, if you're a major tech company and the question is, oh, my, my account's been hacked, please help me. Here are my credentials. That's not for crowds. But if someone's going, does anyone know how to do this? In, oh no, use it for that software, or if someone's got a, oh, I don't know how to do this, does anyone have any ideas? We can, we can help you with crowds, and crowds really lets you 
go below the waterline and address the rest of the iceberg, all the stuff that you don't usually see. So that's crowds in a, in a small nutshell. And this is what it looks like. So this is just one still. I'm not going to walk you through all of it, but just so you have a, a, bit, a bit of an idea, with this being a navigation between all the different types of content, this is all the stuff that we pull in, and this is where your interaction will happen. Very easy. It's dead simple. If you're an expert, all you have to do is sign up with your Twitter account and say, well, I'm interested in all of these out of a choice. I speak those languages and that's it. We will make everything else really simple for you. And so the weird bit, actually, I'm going to go back one, the, the, the really tricky bit about crowds and the bit that is usually the hardest to explain is that the people, the crowds users, are not employees. They are people who are just happy to help. And so bearing that in mind, so where we have that relationship with first the clients, the people who actually pay us to set up crowds for them, and the users, they're two completely separate. There's no relationship of power. There's no, no, no one can't tell the other what to do. What would we do you think the main one or two challenges would be for product manager when we're working in that kind of situation. Does anyone have any suggestions apart from you guys? Okay. The, well, the challenge is this. How do you make it work when client and user define value differently and have completely different requirements? The, the clients are the companies they're probably, they are companies who have a problem and are looking for a, a solution. So they're in this as an economic agent. Users are people who want to help, but do not, and will never see the, 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 the admin section at the back end. They just want to help and they will see bits of the app that the client will never use. Those two groups are completely separate, have different agendas, different motivations, different everything. And yet we have to make this work for everyone. And that's kind of been the, well, that's what we've been working on for the past three something years. And that is what I'd like to talk to you about. Tonight, I'd just like to share a few thoughts as to how, what we went through, um, what it's taught us and what you might take away if you ever want to design a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, sorry, a B2B2C um, app that is something different than an e-commerce solution. So first one is, how do you break ground? How do you manage your chicken and the egg? The, chi the, the trick of the, the, the question being this, if you don't have a good app that meets your client's need, you don't have a client. I'll go, yeah, that's very nice, I'm not interested. If you don't have all the features that you need to make it cool for the users, you don't have any users to answer the questions. So would you rather have a really cool but empty room or a room that's not so cool, but that's full of people that are really having fun. Well, that's, that's, where, that's the dilemma that we had uh, a while back. And here's, how, here's a few things um, that we, I took away from it. The first one is, where do you start? And I would say, and this is just me, this is, I'm not representing Conversocial here, this is just my opinion. I would say start with a client for the simple reason that the client has a defined and existing need. That means that they know what they want and they know that they want it. They have a clear end game with win conditions and hopefully they've got resources that you can use for your MVP. So for example, just to give you a little bit of history on, on crowds, um, crowds sprung originally from discussion from people at Google. Google are clients of Conversocials. They use some of our other solutions and they have a wonderful community of uh, experts who help Google users on forums mainly. And if, you, if you've ever used any Google um, products and searched for a solution online and someone just popped out of nowhere and gave you wonderful you know, help, it's these people. And Google said, wouldn't it be really great if we could find a way for these people to engage with our, with our customers in other platforms? And we said, yes, it would. I had no idea how to do it, but that's how we got started. So we, start, we, we had you know, deep conversations and we thought about it. And long story short is in the end, B2B 
because you're talking to rational, um, a rational economic agent, you can come up out of this with a business model canvas, some win conditions, and assumptions register. So the business model canvas is how are you going to be charging this, who are you going to be selling this to, uh, what do you need to make it work, and so on and so on. The win conditions is, well, you know what? Um, our clients want to reach either um, take some of the load that goes to the agents and transfer it to other people, or they just want to make their clients happy, or they want to reach people they were, could, they were previously unable to reach. And that builds your assumptions register, where you say, well, all of this at that stage is, this is about the only thing that we know for sure. The, all the other stuff is what we think our best guess is, and based on, on our research, we think this and that. And so you put all this in your assumptions register, and you say, well, from the client's side, this is what they want. This is the goal. This is what we're shooting for. We want to create this tool that does this. And then you go see the user, and that's where it gets interesting. Because the user is key. There's no user, no value. You can have the best one in the world if there's no one using it. Well, tough luck. And there's a, a couple of things about that that I'll get to in a second, but it makes for a very interesting problem. And you have to create a completely independent set of documents for, for this new, uh, for these users that have to be completely separate from what you did for the clients. And you need to do a product vision board. So basically a simplified uh, business model canvas where you explain what the, what the product is, but you don't have to worry about you know, who's going to be paying for it because it's not the users. You do your ethnographic research, so your personas and all that. So who would be using this? Your use cases, how are you going to be using it? Your user case matrix, which is basically once you start matching things, what emerges as our key, um, key demographics and our target uh, users. Key expectations on the user side, because they don't come in with no expectations. They've, there's plenty of solutions out there where they can help people, and they've been doing it very well for years and years. So we're not going in there as you know, saviors saying, hey, this is what you've been waiting for forever. We go in there with, look at this shiny new thing that we haven't built yet. Interested? And that's, as you can guess, it's not something that people react to immediately. And finally, you can build a second assumptions re um, register where you say, well, here's a different bunch of uh, assumptions that we'll need to prove or disprove that are completely unrelated to anything else. And at that point, you're ready to get cracking and do and make the magic happen. Because you're going to have to take those two things and work out a bunch of solutions that are, at that stage, hard to prove or disprove. The, book, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have to create a product backlog with three types of things. So first, the important commonalities. For example, um, the brand's going to go, I want, uh, I want users to help uh, clients with problems because that's what I want them to do. And the user can say, well, I want to help people because that's something I enjoy doing. Great, that's a commonality. And there's a bunch that are really important. Secondly, you've got all the stuff that only the clients care about. So I want data, I want an admin section, I want a backend, what's your API? All that kind of stuff that the users really don't care about. And finally, you have what I call the user environment, and I'll get to this in a minute in, in, in um, more detail, but it's basically all the stuff that the user cares about really deeply, but that the company doesn't care about, not directly. And once you do this, you can start building, so your product backlog, you can start ordering it, the usual, I don't think I need to get into too much detail there. And, but you have to start creating your feature value matrix, uh, matrix, sorry, which is basically a simple way of explaining the value of one feature to different people. Because you're not going to be stressing the same things to the same people all the time. You have to, you're going to have to explain the same thing to people who have a commercial background, people who have a technical background, people who've got no background at all in any of that but are users. And finally, you, have your, you can start testing those assumptions that you had in your register. And that's, this was the hard part. The hardest part is we've got all this, but how do you, where do you decide what to build first? So what we said is what we're going to do is we're going to build an MVP, and the MVP is going to have... The, the smallest critical loop that we can. The first thing that we built is 
how can a user answer a question in a way that they, it's more enjoyable to them than it, than it is to do on another platform. So it's more fun to use crowds than it is to use a forum. That's, that's it, that's the smallest thing. You bring the question, give it to the right person, that person shoots back. That's it, that's how we built it. Nothing else, a little bit of, a little bit of a, um, so I'm, I'm looking at my, one of my uh, programmers over there who's gonna kill me when I say nothing else. There's actually a lot in the background. But we really kept it as simple as possible building a previous experience from, uh, from our other products. But then you get the question of the environment, which um, is the essential additional user requirements. When I said that there's something deeply, deeply fun is that when we were talking about users, the people who actually answer questions in crowds, there are people who are external to the company. The company doesn't pay them, doesn't reward them directly, and you have no way of forcing anyone to do anything. When you have the, your regular customer support software, the manager buys it, says, I love that one, and then no, turns around and tells his team, you know what, start using it because that's the one I want to start using. End of discussion. Everybody else, no, just no, has to use it. In this case, no. Each individual user will have to make a conscious decision to, uh, to start using crowds. And that means that we have to be, we are competing with everything else in that person's life. That person is answering questions on their free time. Would they rather be spending time, they could rather be spending time um, with their family, playing video games, going to the movies. That's kind of like tough competition. I mean, all of you, think about it. After work, do you want to just go on an app and start you know, answering questions for strangers? Most of you, myself included, not necessarily, especially since it's all people that you don't know. And so we had to find a way, and, we, and the, the major hurd, one of the major hurdles that we have had when explaining this to potential clients is they look at us and go, who are these users? And why do they do this? It doesn't make any sense. They, it doesn't, in, in, if you think that the user is a, an economic agent. It does if you look at the research that exists as to why they use, uh, they, they use uh, and forums or crowds for helping people. I know there's a, a former Google expert in the, in the room. I know who he is. I don't want to point any fingers. So if he's comfortable to raise his hand, and just like, I'd like to ask him a couple of questions. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to you know, call you out. What made you, so you, you were a Google TC, so top contributor and expert, and you, were part of the Google program for, I think, just short of two years, and you used crowds, the early versions. Why do you like, or why do you help people? I think there's a, a human nature, isn't it, to either be someone who helps other people. I think when you, especially being a product manager, when you get knowledge over time, you kind of have that, you know, you want to give back to as many people as possible. <laughs> I think that's why a lot of client managers go into things like mentoring and consulting and you know, starting their own businesses because they want to give back what they've learned. And I think that was kind of a key part of it. And, um, and there were also other perks, such as you know, going to San Francisco or YouTube and Pizzas, which kind of helped it in a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, it was that uh, you, you join a community as well, as there was a community of top contributors, there was about 20 of us. Um, and I think I was one of about four in the UK. And um, yeah, it was good. I love your answer because it's exactly what I have on my next slide. Uh, so thank you very much, first of all, for, for agreeing to, to um, tell us a bit more about this. As you might remember, I t said earlier on uh, that I come from, I originally uh, worked in video games. And there's a lot of video game uh, theory that w goes into this. So it's, it's kind of old news in video games, but it's, not, it's something that's kind of slowly trickling down into more mainstream tech. And so exactly what you're talking about. The research shows that people do um, do, uh, do this for four things. The first one, altruism, which is the first one you mentioned. People like to help. Some people will volunteer with the RSPCA. Some people will just help the you know, elderly lady next door. Whatever it is, people like to help. And that's it. That's, no, that, that makes them happy, and that's why they're doing it. Some people like economic gain. They help people. They're not being paid, but as you said, 
trip to San Francisco every now and then with Google, not bad. Some people like the status. One thing that we have is experts across all our clients are usually people who have a connection with the brand. So some people like Google experts are people who really feel strongly about Google products. But we also have clients that um, are video game companies. So people love those video games. We've got people who uh, have an interest in the matter subject and will answer answering questions, not because necessarily they like the very serious big company that does, treats with that, but because they like the idea behind it. And f they want... Uh, they want to be part of that. They want to be part of that world and they want to have something else that you were talking about is you want to be part of that community and it's a community that makes sense and to you it's something that has value socially. And finally, something that people, one thing that motivates people is people want to be the best at helping. And that's, that's, those are the four things and everyone who helps other people is somewhere on that quadrant. It's usually more than one Thing. As you said, it's a bit, usually a bit of a mix, so you're somewhere in between in the, in the um, diamond. But those are the four things. But that means that when we have to explain to people, to our clients or potential clients, why you would be using this, people go, no, nah, I, don't, I, I don't think so. Do you, do people are like, yes, here's a number of companies where this works perfectly, and it, it's not a good fit for every company, because, no, for example, if you are a company that makes washing machines. You might not have enough people who are passionate about washing machines to do this, but for, in most cases, for a lot of big clients, this is a very viable solution. And that means that once, if, if companies accept this and they accept this dichotomy, they, they can start to understand and accept the challenge that we are faced and that they are faced with, which is uh, namely, we need, to f we need to keep our clients happy and we need to keep our users happy. And so, um, another oxymoron, the superfluous essential. As free agents, the, your users have requirements outside of the narrow scope of basic client requirements. For example, the clients say, all I need is that, you know, that loop where they, people can answer questions for me, that's all I need. Don't need anything else, don't bother, that's the, that's the bit I want. The user's gonna say, I know that, that bit's good, I like helping people. But how about the other stuff? Because right now I'm not having fun. Or if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be worn out after 15 minutes. Fair enough. It's our job to make it so that it's enjoyable for you for as long as you stay. And hopefully, if we do a good job, you're going to spend more time answering questions every day, helping more people, because we are going to make it easier for you. And so we have, for example, a number of features. I don't think I need to delve too, uh, into these too much right now. But we have a number of features that we think, th we think are very important. The users think they're very important. Brands in general, they think they're nice, but to be honest, if they, you know, they, it's not necessarily wouldn't be the top of their backlog if, they, if, we, if we'd ask them solely. So for example, leaderboards. Where do you stand in the community? Like you score points when you help people, you know if you're at the top of the leaderboard, bottom of the leaderboard. This is not something that has any economic value for clients, but it's something that people care about. Incentivization. We, part of the program is if you want people to help, you can give them like a, a reward. So it's not just trips to New, New York, New York and, and free tech, but it just might be a, uh, a mention on Twitter or something to reward people for a, a job well done. And finally, it might just be something as simple as built-in communication channels. People want to, our social animals, as, as uh, <laughs> people say, you want to, you're part of a group, you're part of four people in the UK. Well, it's nice if you can speak to those four people without having to use uh, other platforms. And so something that's, what, that's really important for us is striking that balance. And you will only be able to do that if people accept this condition. Like you cannot be a crowd's client if you don't accept that this is not just some kind of this is not just your run-off-the-mill um, support solution. This is B to B to C. If you don't, the C being the users, obviously. If you don't appeal to them, the rest is completely irrelevant. You cannot, you cannot power through. You cannot do any of that. You have to accept that we have to build some stuff that, quite frankly, as a client, you don't necessarily care too much about. Some clients do and are very good about it. Some clients just kind of go, "Okay, fine, do it," but no, let's move on and get cracking and do other stuff. Um, 
as you can tell, I, I like big words because they're fun. Um, something, and this is the bit where the designers will, their ears will perk, you know, up. Uh, asymmetric simplicity. Because you've got two sets of people to satisfy your clients and users, you need to have possibly two completely different approaches to design because you will not be able to make everyone happy with just one solution. So don't be afraid to really look at it in two completely different ways. And so Susanna hasn't seen any of this, so I think right now she's a bit, a bit worried. But what this means is basically this. When you're designing for clients, so they're the people who see the economic gain behind uh, using crowds. But these people, A, they can be trained or supported individually, which means you can teach them how to use crowds. If something is not quite there yet, or a bit complicated, or a bit obscure, or not quite optimized, that's fine. They're at work, they've got plenty of time, they're being paid to be there, they're happy to be trained, and there's not too many of them. That's the, they also have the economic incentive to use your tool. So, um, don't want to do the sales pitch for crowds here, but helping someone on crowds is three times cheaper than helping uh, someone through your regular Twitter agent thing. And it's, I think, eight times cheaper than uh, email. So there is something there, but so if you, that's, that will make people happy. And finally, because they expect a high degree of customization, they also accept some pain points. So for example, um, at, some, at one point, the admin section was not very intuitive. It wasn't very pretty. Some stuff was a bit you know, buried a bit deep and it was, it was hard to use, but that's fine. Users, or the other end of the spectrum. Because you cannot onboard your users individually. Basically what happens when a, a client sends people, so some of the experts who crowds, is they usually either invite them directly, say, hey, here's the link, click on that. Or they put it up somewhere on their website where they say, hey, if you would like to be an, age, uh, um, an expert, here's where you can go. And that's it. There are some, um, there's a help section in crowds, obviously, but we cannot onboard those people individually and they've got no external incentive to use this tool. They already have their, they already have their forums, they have their Twitter things. They, so really, if we don't catch their, their eye in the first few seconds or if at any point in the first five minutes they kind of go, this is a bit of a chore, what's this? They'll just know, bounce and never come back. And which is so that, that's, that onboarding is the first challenge that we have. And the second one is, whereas a client will have a longer uh, user flow, so for example, your, your average uh, client might uh, interact with the admin section maybe once a day, twice a day at most, your users will do the same loops a lot for quite a bit of time. People spend a lot of time in the app if they decide to use it. And if something's a pain point, they're just going to stop using it. So I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you individual questions, but out of, uh, out of curiosity, how much time do you spend, do you think the average crowds user spends in day, in, uh, in app every day? So who thinks it's less than 20 minutes? Every day they will spend 20 minutes of their free time helping other people. 20 to 40, so less than 20 minutes, we've got four people. 20 to 40. Yeah, about 10, 40 to 60. Yes, yeah, six, seven people. More than an hour every day. Cool, congratulations. P three people just won the, the quiz. People across clients, so this is not just no Google or that company. People will spend on average 67 minutes a day helping people. That's 67, day, uh, 60, 67 minutes each and every day. That's an hour per day helping people in app. In that time, because we do a good job, people will, will help a lot of people and go through the same loops potentially 20, 30 times. So the average is, uh, I think right now, it's just above, uh, the average uh, expert helps a little bit over, I think it's seven people per day on average. But we've got some outliers who've helped literally 10,000 people in the past year. So we need to make sure that these people are having a good time. So simplicity and ease of use is our goal here. And this is something I cannot stress enough. If you're doing B2B2C, you have to make sure that the people who are there for the money 
get the royal suite. The rest, it doesn't mean that you, you don't, shouldn't be making an effort, but that's where the, the trick is. And this is what crowds look like when we, it was an MVP. I know it looks like you know, 2004, it wasn't. This was uh, until I think like, that, that was the first year. But this is what, how, what it looked like when we validated the core loop. So it's a table, so you can see all your questions are, are here, a couple of filters in that way, and then you get a bunch of stuff here, and it was not the best experience. I think that's the one that you used. I'm not gonna ask you if it was suboptimal, but I'm guessing it was. Maybe, possibly. But um, what we did is we decided, once we validated that, to kind of take it to the next level, add a whole bunch of features, and make it really cool and slick. So our design team did a cracking job, and despite, so now it looks like this, as you can remember. And we've, I, I know it doesn't really show, but we added a lot of features, a lot of cool stuff, and the really cool thing is we still managed to get a SUS score of 92. So for those of you who aren't familiar with how SUS works, it's not a percentage. 92 puts us in the top, what, like 1%? or 0.5% or something of... Yeah, the, the medium is like 16, or like standard uh, experiences, and like more than I think 18 is, is like an excellent score. So this is AAA um, experience. It doesn't look like much, because obviously once, you know, once we figured out how to make it simple and beautiful, it's obvious. There's a lot of work that went into this, and, um, and it was really, we got really good um, feedback from uh, all the experts across all our clients. And this was really the, the key, is this is where you will make or break your app. When you're trying to appeal to people, this is where you need to focus your, your efforts. If, um, if you've got limited resources, design resources, this is where you make it snazzy. The clients, they don't care if it's gray and dull. The users do, and they should. And this is, the simpler uh, bit. And, but recently we released a new feature, uh, which is a clipboard, which lets people create and manage basically clippings that they can reuse really quick so that they can literally answer uh, questions. I think it's like five times faster. So if it's something that they've seen before, there's a bunch of cool features, you know, two clicks, done. And, even, and that's, I think, our most complicated feature to date. And uh, we, we released it so this is, um, it won't mean much to you, but this is just kind of to, to show you kind of like, you've got things like filters over here and you can you know, manage, you've got tags and you've got counters and you can do things per category and we've got quick search and suggestions and there's, it's, very, it's all smartly done. We still have a, a, a SUS score of 89 and we're not done yet. We, um, this is something that we released uh, three months ago and um, our design team is already working on, a, on an iteration because we want to make it better. It's good, but not good enough yet. So this is where we focus our efforts. This is where we have, you, and if you want to, to uh, do B2B2C, this is, in my opinion, where you'll have to concentrate all your design energy. So fourth thing, creating an informed impulse. I like those words. But basically it means balancing listening with guiding clients and users. The advantage that you have when you have an, uh, a, kind of, a kind of app that people are familiar with is you can explain it very simply. For example, uh, you can say, well, it's like Deliveroo, but for this. It's, it's like Snapchat for cats. People, three words, four words, people get the idea. When we started talking to people beyond Google, who were, no, who were kind of part of the, of the equation from the start, we kind of went, so it's a bit like, but not really, and so you've got these people that you don't pay who do stuff for an hour a day, and people are like, what they, I, yeah, not interested. And so we need to find the balancing act between making sure that people who want to help you um, can, by giving them freedom, what they need to do their thing, and then giving them guidance. And something, if, you, if your app is something that's truly trailblazing, so it's something that you can't just say, well, it's Snapchat for cats, you will need to find who your early adopters are. And within those early adopters, for those of you familiar with the chasm, um, 
I, um, theory, you will need to find the right people within the company, and that's not easy, because if you remember at the very start we were doing um, uh, ethnographic research, you will need to identify what kind of positions will be the people who recommend your, your tool, and are there the people who can actually sign off to buy the tool, or who do you need to convince? So you'll need to find the right people, make the short introductory content available for key questions, so if someone finds crowds or hears about crowds for, uh, through a colleague from another company, they need to be able to kind of have a look at the web page and see and, like, and understand the idea in less than 30 seconds. But then you also need the uh, comprehensive follow-up content as well. And then what about, so for example, when we're talking about the four reasons for people to help using crowds, people go like, what's that based on? Who came up with that no, idea? Right, well, actually, here's the research. So if you, if you think it's a bit far-fetched, no, there's a bunch of guys with PhDs been working on no, for 10 years, so there might be something there. And you need to educate your clients because this tool works, I mean, crowds works very well, makes a lot of people very happy, it's not for everyone, and it does come with its own challenges. So you need to educate people. And that means three things. What do they need to know about external constraints? So you need to tell your clients, well, we'll do our very best to, to help you and make you happy, but we also have to think about our users who have other requirements and we also have external constraints for example we use this is on Twitter so we have technical limitations from you know, what we can do through Twitter so there's a bunch of things that people need to be aware of but you need to do it in a way that makes sense to them and those they report to so you need to make sure that you can define what you do for this idea and define it to different people. You need to be able to explain to a potential expert why they want to be an expert. You need to be able to, to convince a CMO to spend some money on crowds, but you also need to be able to um, talk to a customer support person saying why this is amazing. And if you cannot do that, you will have a very hard time finding your early adopters for your, uh, um, your, your really cool idea. But then you will also be, you will need to be open and transparent about your product backlog and prioritization. And this is something that you don't see with too many companies where people just accept that it's there. For example, um, if you take an uh, ubiquitous tool like uh, Jira, pretty much all of us have heard of Jira, we, know, we use Jira, people use it because it's there and it's, it's a solution that's been there for a long time and it's quite good. But how many people here understand the constraints? How many people here need to be convinced day in, day out to, to use it? No one, because it's just Jira and that's what people use. If you, if you cannot make people understand those constraints, at one point they're gonna go, well, I'm the client, do this, because otherwise I'm not gonna be your client. And sometimes you're gonna to have to go, that's the way it is. And that's because you are the voice of the user. The user will not be talking directly to too many people. They might interact with maybe like a customer, with a customer representative at, their, at the brand they're uh, experts for, but that's about it. So that means that you, you are the one with all the knowledge that you collect from the users. And that means you have to tell a wide variety of people, uh, A, you have to understand, then tell a wide variety of people what people users think and why things are important and why you should do it that way and why it's prioritized that way and you need to be able to back it up and that's the tricky bit because some of it is very easily quantifiable some of it is like when we did this we no, we released this last time productivity went up 10 percent so we're releasing this which is similar so we're hoping to get another 10 percent sometimes you're going to go 90 percent of users want better leaderboards so we think it's important there's a demand um, but we can't tell you if productivity is going to go up 2% or 25%. No idea, but let's give it a go. And you need to balance. Um, so once you educate those clients about your user needs and challenges, you need to balance making your users happy with making the clients happy. And that's the tricky bit. As a product manager, I'm the guy who's in the front lines. I'm, I'm traveling the world all the time, talking to all the big clients and kind of saying, well, here's what we have. I don't know. And they say, oh, but we would want this and we have this. We have this special thing that we need. When can we slot it in? Sometimes we can. Someone, so, so sometimes say, cracking idea. Let's do it. Let's do it like start next sprint 10 days from now, which devs aren't very happy about. But 
That's the perks. Um, sometimes you kind of say, good idea, not straight away. Sometimes you can't, you, you can't tell it, you can't tell people, you're just like, that's a terrible idea, we're never going to do that. Quite simply because, it, yeah, it makes sense for the client, it makes no sense for whatever for the user. And you have to be able, as a product manager, to identify that early and you have to understand that that's where you stand, that's who, whose voice you are. Doesn't mean that you have to, to, to uh, kowtow to users, but you need to, to, be, to understand that the, these are the people whose voice you need to be. And the last challenge that we faced, especially early on, was that Crowds is a very versatile tool. You can do many, many different things with it. Some people, as I said, just want to answer questions. Some people want to, uh, to reach out to new markets. Some people use it to say, we don't offer support in Mandarin because we, don't have, we, don't, we can't afford agents who speak Mandarin, but we have like, a bunch of users who speak Mandarin and can support our community and that's really cool. So there's all these things that you can do and, there's, and we've got so much data that you can use to track your success that at first, when people said, so what does Crowds do exactly? And we say, what do you want it to do? It can do all these things. And we'd like give them like this buffet of, you know, of ideas. And they'd look at us and go, well, I don't know. You tell me, I've never done this before. I've got no idea what I could do with this. And we, so we have to do this buffet, but we have to, you have to tell people, you have to help people and you have to provide leadership. And what you have to need to do, uh, the problem that you will have is that you, when you do that, you will be facing different expectations from all the different um, clients and users because it's not just one client and one user. It's many clients, many users, so you need to juggle that, who've got different levels of understanding. So, for example, the people who run a crowds program for a company day in, day out will have a deep understanding of the tool. They understand exactly what's happening. And then once a year, they need to go talk to their CMO about this little quirky tool that they use and they have to explain it to a guy who's got exactly five minutes to understand what Crowds does and who doesn't care one bit about you know, like making people happy. He just wants to know what, what, how much money is he making us, how much money is he saving you know, us. So you need to, to make that. And people have different levels of buy-in. So that means that some people, you will need to be able to juggle people who are really into Crowds and people who eh, give it a go, but we'll see what happens. And as the central point of contact, you have, the, uh, you have the best overall understanding. And that level of understanding is what gives you the position of leadership. Doesn't, you don't get to tell people what to do, you do get to suggest people. Not because you're smarter, not because no, you, you're, no, you've got the epiphany and that's, no, the, the, your word is law. But you, need, you have that information that people don't have. You have been thinking about this problem for three years. Oh, sorry, I've been thinking about this for three years. I've seen what works, what doesn't work. I've met a lot of users, a lot of clients. I've talked about it all over the world. I've been into, you know, thinking about this. These people, they literally met you five minutes ago and they don't know if what you're talking about is nonsense. So you must show your leadership by increasing your general knowledge. Frame, so then general knowledge and everyone's knowledge of this. You need to be able to frame expectations. And this is very, very, very important. You cannot... I cannot emphasize this enough, is you need to say, here's what we can do, here's what we will never do. You can, you can try it uh, as much as you want, it will not work. And here's some stuff that you can try, but who knows if it will work and I don't recommend it. Uh, we've got clients who have ex uh, extensive programs where day in, day out, their hundreds of experts helps, uh, help thousands of people and it's really, you no, know, that's like, this is what we, we had in mind when we started. And some, some users told us, We've got a bunch of experts who we don't really interact with, but what we do is when there's a problem, we activate them like this. Because for example, let's say you are a big um, tech company and one day your servers you know, come crashing down and you've got like hundreds of people on Twitter going like, what's this? Is it down? What, is it just me? This is rubbish. I paid for this. People are angry and you, you've only got like 10 agents because you, can have, you cannot have foreseen this. So you can't answer everyone. Whereas well, you've got crowds, this, this company said, well, you know what? We should just you know, literally uh, click our fingers and activate all our experts. You can then just for like a few hours be very, very active and, and answer this. And they said, that's what we want to do. To be fair, before, I, I'd, we, we, no, before they told me about it, I was like, that use case never even crossed my mind. It's maybe not what I would suggest, but if it works for you, do it. 
But building on that experience, I can then talk about this experience to other clients and provide leadership to other people because I've, I've built that knowledge using those clients. And so you will be putting people and clients in touch and you will be building this understanding. And slowly, you're gathering more and more understanding and more and more people. And you're moving away from being this quirky little app that's used by two companies to you know, having people from companies you know, call you and say, hey, I'm from this big company who's, and like, or this big bank. And you're like, okay, we're not talking about tech anymore. We're talking about like big banks. Well, that's, no, you will be, and you will be moving and you have, to f you have to cross that chasm. And you can only do that, but you can only do that if you frame your expectations early and often. And if you suggest solutions over possibilities, you've got a buffet, that's what, probably what you're looking for. You want some help customizing? That's fine, we can do that. And the conditions for leadership, because you, you know, it's easy to say, be a leader, I'm a leader. Like, no, I'm not, I'm just some guy that they might or might not listen to. You have to build that position of leadership. And that means um, mostly five things. The first one is you need to be accessible. When you're building a, uh, a B2B to C uh, proposition, especially a quirky one, you need to be involved at every level, which means you're not just talking to other product managers, because you know, product managers love talking to other product managers because we all speak the same language and it's really cool and we understand each other. We're talking to users. We're talking to people who are CMOs, talking to people who are uh, customer support representatives. I you know we've, we've uh, traveled to Asia, to America, you know, across Europe, talking to people with different backgrounds, different, different cultures, different languages, and they all have a different understanding of, what, of how things should exist and should be run. And I can only do this, I can only, you can only gather that intelligence if you are accessible. But you can also only build the goodwill ne necessary for people to want to talk to you and for, to use this if you're transparent. That means, doesn't mean that you tell people everything, but that means that you have to make all the information possible available. For example, we have uh, public Trello boards where you say this is, these are the bugs that, we, that have been reported. That one, yeah, we're fixing it, it's really bad. That one, no, because honestly, it's a lot of work for not much. Here's our product, back, no, here's our product backlog, and it's really cool. And people might agree or disagree, but the, you, people cannot and have never faulted us for not sharing information. We are transparent as to what we do and why we do it. And sometimes it also involves admitting when things go wrong, and sometimes they do. Um, I, I go, for example, to uh, the Google conference every year uh, for, for experts, and I'm in, a, in front of a sea of experts. There's something like 200 or 300 of you who are very nice people, the nicest people you ever meet. They're all there to help, and they're all very altruistic, but they will also roast you like you wouldn't believe. And I'm like, why is this not fixed? I, that's rubbish. Did you, did you mess up? And you, you can't just say, well, we think that KPI is like, no. Sometimes you kind of go, yeah, we didn't mess up, how can we fix it? And that's something, if you're, if you're that quirky little B2B to C, you need to be able to do that with everyone. You need to have the goodwill, A, you need to have the confidence to do that. You need to have the goodwill built up for them to accept that you're gonna fix it and that you cannot just talk, say one thing to one side and one thing to the other side. It will come crumbling down. If you, you have to be very, very honest because that's your strength and that's how you're gonna cross the chasm. And you have, uh, so I kind of stepped onto my fourth point, communicate uh, clearly with all signs. And finally, um, before, um, something that's important too, is you have to balance expectations. And you have to balance that. So I've, I've talked at length about that, so I'm not gonna go over it again. But something that you have to do is you have to balance utility and visibility. Because you are servicing so many different people, users, and clients, sometimes something that you're doing for one group is completely invisible to the other group. So sometimes, no, you're gonna go, we need to redo a bit of the back end because right now it's not scaling properly, so it's, we're gonna do this bit. And the user's gonna go, it's been four months since you released something for us. Where, what, what are you guys doing? You're still here. So we kind of have to say, well, we're doing that bit, but they don't care about that bit because that's not their bit, or it's not something that affects them directly. So you have to maintain the balance between what's visible to all and that means that you have to think, think about ways that you can bring value and transparency to everyone. For example, um, when we designed the, um, the refoundation of the app, you know, the, when we went from the MVP that looked a bit 2004 to the new thing, that process took 
uh, from start to finish a few months. And so, in, but instead of just saying, we're going to do our thing, we're going to start coding, coders are going to do no, uh, we'll be uh, t typing away, and then, ta-da, one day, what we did is, because we did a lot of user research and UX testing, and, and you can talk to Susanna about the whole thing, because, you no, know, she, she's the expert here, but we spent a lot of time talking to people. We made sure that that was visible, so that we, we shared our insights, we shared our trials, we shared our errors, we updated people, we had uh, communications, we had um, hangouts every month with communities. Now, right, this Thursday, um, for example, Chris and I will be talk would have been talking to Google users. Next time, it's going to be uh, users from another company and saying, this is what we're looking at, here's the challenges, what do you think? And that means that by, oh, by doing that, we, we were able to maintain visibility as we're doing utility, and that gave us a lot of room to, uh, to breathe because people don't just, if they're subscribing to your quirky B2B to C, originally, if they're the early adopters, they're the people who will help you, they are interested in what you're doing, not just the final result, but chances are that they're thinking, this could go, I believe in this, but I want to be shown that I'm right. I want to, to know if I was right to, uh, to trust you or not. And finally, um, a big part, I think, of, of navigating the, the early months of, uh, of building something like this is that you need to make sure that people know that you're a positive force. I'm someone who's there to enable my clients. I'm there to enable my development team, uh, my design team, pretty much everyone. Sometimes I'm going to have to say no. We all do this as product managers. You've got your backlog, your priorities and constraints. You have to make sure that people from different backgrounds understand this because sometimes you're gonna to have to say no to people who have no reason to accept that you said no. If you say, if the users who are volunteers and are just you know, there because they're having fun and they think that you're a cool guy and that they're surrounded by cool people, if once they say no, because we think that we can't do it, do it, or quite frankly, it's not a good idea, then you go, is he really that nice? Do I still wanna use this? If people know why you say no and they know that it's coming from a good place and you can explain why, that will help tremendously. And that's a condition for leadership, is if you, if you I'm not just here to say yes. I'm, I will always try to empower people, but I also sometimes have to say, well, no, that's, that's the limit, that's where we stop. We're not going there and that's it. So that's me, uh, that's um, all I have for you right now. Uh, I hope it will shed some light as to how we did things in the, in the early stages and so how we're still doing things. Um, so if you've got any questions for me uh, directly about what, I, what I've uh, shared or anything else that you would like to discuss about anything tangential to this, or if you've got any questions for our UX designer or for our coders, they're over there, they're just saying no, but you're <laughs> trapped in this room. So does anyone have any questions? Did you have to uh, make two value propositions for users and one for clients? So, yes. Yeah. So you have to understand what your value proposition is to the user, but you're not presenting it. That's the, that's the, the tricky bit, because when you go to the client, you're going to say, use crowds because our value proposition is this. When you're talking to the user, a, mostly you don't get to, you're not the one who pitches this new tool. No, you have to go through a third party. So the community manager at that company will say, hey guys, here's, here's what we have. But also you have to make that value proposition clear without ever stating it. So you, you can, the best you can say is, it's cool, it will help this and here's what it will do for you, that's it. But you cannot formulate it as a proper value proposition, even though in the background when you do your, your uh, product summary, you, you do know what that is. From a product perspective, I mean, just in this context of conversation, um, who would be your customer within our organization? Is it more um, the customer support guys or like the marketing? Because it can be looked or from a brand perspective as well. Hmm. So, that's a so that's a very good question because one of the hurdles that we had was early on we would go to customer support because we, uh, our other tool is a customer support tool, so we have a lot of people who know about this and have been working with us for years. But we would go, look at this snazzy tool. The customer, a lot of customer support guys would say, this is really good, I want this. But they're not the ones with the, with the, the checkbook. Mm -hmm. So then they would go to talk to, usually it's marketing or someone higher up who 
then we have to, so we had to formulate different value proposition for them. We had to make it understandable to them why they would want crowds and why it's useful. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said you need to be able to explain this to different people. You need to empower the people within those companies who will, on your behalf, talk to the CMO. And that will be a very, very uh, tough hurdle to jump. So I'm not going to lie. And that's so right now we, with crowds, it's mo mostly um, customer support and community engagement people. Those are the people who are um, uh, most involved. Okay. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah, so when you launch your app, um, would you recommend to use like a tool to analyze all the data and the, the, the user's behaviors to take your um, next decisions in terms of how to modify the app, how to iterate the app? Or would you say you, you would uh, just travel, meet your clients and gather feedbacks and then so that might be a Zuzana question, but uh, what we did mostly is talk directly to users, and we did a lot. So we did we did do a lot of uh, also a lot of um, um, surveys. So you know qu asking questions, but we also do a lot of user testing. While we'd be there noting hesitations, deviations, and we would create um, good prototypes, you know that people could click through. Because all that, all that stuff that we did early on made, then made it easier for us to go into production because we knew that we already had the kind of data that we needed. But um, we, do, we do use some software for tracking uh, other things. But I think, to me, the most, the most important thing was really the interaction with, you, with the users and, and getting that kind of feedback directly. But on Do you have uh, like two separate backlogs, one for your users and your clients? So no. Together. And then how do you prioritize like your business needs versus your clients needs? So we have one backlog, but every, um, every item has two user stories. How do we pitch this to the client? And how do we pitch this to, I mean, how do we present value for the user? How we emphasize this is, um, so how we order this is primarily because when we did our MVP, we identified a bunch of pain points. So for example, uh, repetitive questions. So we did the, we did the, um, the clipboard. But we, so we already identified this. And what we would do is where can we, how we prioritize it is, how can we increase productivity in a way that we can, where we can track results? So for example, at some point we can say, we, we need to find a way where we can say if the increase in productivity is due to this or due to that. So that's, and that would drive how we did things is, this is the biggest pain point that we can identify. We need to address this and in a way that we can track, where we can track what we're doing. And then we work, what we do is we, we cycle down uh, the, the, um, the items and we iterate. So for example, we released, the uh, clipboard back in October, I think, and we will be doing it. We will be iterating on this fairly soon because we we've got feedback, and then it will rotate. At one point, say we're happy with this feature. It will it will either go back into the bottom of the backlog as a V2. So sometime in the future, we've got a bunch of ideas that we're going to do, or we're going to say that's we're done. We've done the best we could do. Having said that, how you juggle that is also based on. Um, It's, it's not just what, you're, what you think the, the feature should be, is how can you sell it to more, uh, how can you sell the idea? I'm not talking about selling like in, in a monetary fashion here, but how can you explain the value to more people? Because sometimes, you, for example, users are gonna say, uh, one discussion that we had recently was they say, when, when, I hate, when I wanna help someone, I want to see their Twitter profile because I wanna know more about the person that I'm helping because it might inform my, uh, the, the support that I offer. That's something that users wanted and we implemented. That's not something that clients cared about because no, we cannot demonstrate value. But we could say, well, no, we've done this. We've just done, delivered this for clients and this added this. Right now we're doing this. And on average, a person checking, um, uh, checking uh, a Twitter profile natively will uh, go out of the app for like 20 seconds, whatever it is. So if you take this away, 
then you, 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 people who spend this amount of time in app can do this much more, and this is the value that we're creating, and you can track that. So that's how we, we, we went from clients, user, client, user. But usually, the, the fun thing is you can actually find that there's a happy medium where pretty much all the features that we do are something that are of interest and that we can explain to both, both sides. Just going off the back of that, if you haven't launched your app yet and you're um, picking which features you want to launch with, mm. do you kind of do it as a 50-50 split? Because you obviously don't have results to test mm. on. It's kind of like a starting um, point. I would, I, so what we did is created the app. It's, it's like a proper MVP. There was no, like, it was very bare bones. And, um, the, uh, and we were lucky enough to be able to identify early adopters amongst the user community where we could say, hey, users, it's not fun yet, but here's what we have, what, what we have in mind. And if you can find that core target, the people who stick with you while it's not fun, it, will, it means that you can, you can test those assumptions that we had in the very, I think, the second slide of my presentation, and you can, you can move from there. But that means that you need to find those people before you launch the MVP or as soon as you launch it because that will let you build things until you have a viable solution for both sides. But in the, in the, in the, in the beginning, it will be client heavy. Yeah. I'm, so I'm getting back to you. Um, in terms of uh, customer for clients from, for, for uh, social, uh, is it more uh, kind of um, beneficial for established clients or like the startup would also be, um, can take advantage of this? So startups like typically are on the other side when they're still trying to build something. So having experts of what they haven't built might be different. I think. So yes, so you're right. So two things. The first thing I want to say is I'm talking just about crowds because we've got these other offerings that are conversational. So those are like separate things. But for crowds, most of our clients are uh, medium to large companies. Uh, a lot of them are tech, gaming, even though we have more no brick and mortar businesses joining us. You can use it as a as a startup, but if uh, even if you don't have your experts, yes, what some of our uh, users do is that they, when if you want to have customer support through through Twitter, uh, most solutions and it's not just Comsocial will say, well, you have to buy a seat. A seat is this many thousand pounds, and such and such. And no, it's it's very it's not very flexible. What you do with crowds is we say, you just pay for, for this much for like this many searches. You can have as many users as you want. And so what the, the and it's, it's quite cheap. And what startups do is they just say, well, we're gonna use our own employees and put them on crowds and they use it as a filter to interact with people on Twitter. So that it's not just customer support, but customer engagement and they can do customer support. So that's how a smaller company would do it. Right, so they basically would use for discovery down the line. Yeah. And then, as you grow and you start having experts, if you have a product that people are passionate about, you can transition them and you would not change your pro you don't have to change your program. It, because it's very flexible, you, you don't have to just drop it and pick another solution, just either scale it or just shift the population of experts away from being employees to being proper users like most companies. Sorry, it's, it's a continuation possibly of that, but you talk a lot about these clients who have experts. Yeah. How involved are you in finding, in creating, in because obviously if you don't have them, then yeah. your product, you know, you've got the notion of users yeah. and everybody needs a user. And I understand the good work that you've done to keep them once you've got them. But how do you, how, or do you not build we, those bases? We do not build it directly. As in, I'm not going to go in most times and know to find those users. What we do have, though, is a number of resources that explain to people who don't have that resource, that pool of, of available experts, how to create that community. So it's, and then we, we can accompany them and kind of like give them, you know, uh, guide, provide guidance because, you no, know, that's our, uh, it's my background. So I can say, hey, have you tried this? Oh, you've got this many people. Have you tried that? And so on, so on. But I do not get involved. I'm not going to you know, do it. I'm not going to do the heavy lifting myself. The basic way of doing it, if, you, if you've got zero experts, is to find um, a pool of experts with similar interests. For example, if you, you've got a music app, 
you don't have any experts, but you, you know that there's this other music app where that you know, people would have the kind of right profile. Well, you might, we might say, you know what, you might want to see if you can approach some of those people and state your value proposition and talk about what we're doing and, and, and not take it from there. Then you, you attract a few people and then you just start you know, putting in a bit of string until you, you get like a pool of experts. It's the trickiest bit is you need to have a product that has some appeal to people. As I said, if you're, if you're building um, chairs, like regular chairs, not design chairs, and you want experts, it's tricky. But if you're a tech company, or if you've got uh, an app that people are really passionate about, or if you're into games, you already have those people. You just need to find them and empower them. And that's, there is a bit of setup. So once you have that, crowds requires a fairly, uh, fairly little um, maintenance. So you don't have to, you know, you can, get, you can have 10,000 experts or 50 experts. It's the same amount of work for, for that per for person running the program. But there is a setup phase where you need, to, you need to reach that stage where you say, I'm comfortable with how many people I have or I want more. And that's, that's where it's, it can be tricky for some companies. But we do provide solutions as to how to do that or suggestions or, or literature as to how to do that. Sorry, one and then two. Oh, is it me? Yes. Oh, wait, I was going to ask, um, maybe this is a question for your designers, like um, what software do you use when you're prototyping your um, designs and how easy is it to create a new version? So, so it is, it, I mean, you can either, I can, I can give you the short answer or you can then go to Zuzana who will tell you exactly what we use. Um, and, you, and do throw stuff at me if I, if I get it right, uh, wrong. Uh, so for the rawest of uh, designs, we use Balsamic. And then when we might want to make it prettier, we use Envision. And or we use Sketch. Uh, and then for prototyping, for like very linear prototyping Envision, uh, we don't usually have too many uh, interactions with any app. Uh, but we do, and we we usually we test early and we test often, mm -hmm. even with just very basic pro prototype. And then we have high resolution mockups where mm -hmm. everything's clickable and it looks just like the real thing. And then people are a bit disappointed when some some bits don't do anything because they don't realise it's not the app. Mm -hmm. But for that's what we use for for design software. Mm -hmm. yeah. so just going back to the the kind of user client just have you experienced an internal lens as well that you then have to balance against your kind of external requirements so i don't know yes that's so in a way that's tr the, that's very tricky because usually if someone internally tells you no we can't do that because quite simply it's we we literally cannot do it, not because we don't want to, but we can't. Usually that it's very non-negotiable, so it's, it's tricky. But at the same time, that's where we have the most flexibility because I can go and badger my devs until they do find a solution because they're much smarter than I am. So we can find something that gets the job done until we can actually do it. And so uh, we, the, only, the only problem that, we've, that I've run into in, in that capacity was how do we how do we get enough devs to develop fast enough because you know, it's a very competitive market out there a lot of devs a lot of people want devs and so when that i think that was the only bottleneck to, f apart from that we 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 are we've always so far um received excellent feedback from all our clients about what we do and in what order and there have only been a couple of times where we had to say no for internal reasons where like literally we we cannot do it there's been a bunch of times where people say oh you should do this and we say no we cannot because we we are based i mean we, we work through twitter so we have to pull stuff from twitter and some stuff you just can't pull from twitter that's just it, they don't do it but that would be, we can't do it because of an external factor. And only a couple of times uh, it's been for internal and it's usually gone down pretty well because we were always very transparent and we were, we came to them with the, the no, but a recommendation and usually either workaround or uh, like a, an alternate solution. Just one in the back. Yeah, are they, are they still the development? 
how would you define your personas? Like the first mentally is B to B, B to C. How do you how do you identify the eggs and the pig? So maybe personas at the other stage before I mean doing the stage of the MVP for the next stage. So the, the, we were lucky enough that the people that we need to make personas for, we could talk to them before we built anything. Because we, the, the, this sprang originally from a conversation with Google, who we've got an excellent relationship with. We said, hey, can we talk to all your users, your, your experts? And said, yeah, sure, go. So we could talk to those people and have proto-personas and have all that fleshed out before we built anything. So that was the advantage. The, the tricky bit for us was not uh, doing the persona for users because we had access to those people. The tricky bit was making uh, proper personas for our clients because, as I said, usually when we, when, we, when we reach out or people who reach out to us are customer support people. We say, oh, this looks really great. Can you give me more literature? And then if they come back to say, this is crack, no, cracking stuff, can, can we, how can we make the, how we can take this further? So, well, at one point, no. We need to talk money because you need, you know, you need to, to buy this solu uh, solution. And they say, oh, I need to convince the person with the, the, the checkbook. And the problem that we have is customer support is one of those departments that sits in a variety of other departments usually. Sometimes they're part of marketing. Sometimes they they're, are their own thing. Sometimes they're part of live ops. And we had to create personas for all the different C-level people that we might have to explain this value to. Because if, you, no, if, if the person who has the checkbook is uh, the CMO, they're going to be thinking in terms of marketing. So we're going to say, well, here's, here's what it does, and it's really cool. Added bonus, if you're a marketer, because it's on Twitter, a lot of people will see your, your, your uh, users doing good things. Because if it's an email thing, it's like person sending the email and person answering the email. That's the only two people who will ever know about the interaction. But if you've got these really cool people doing really cool stuff on Twitter, it gets retweets, it gets views, it gets you know, positive um, exposure. For example, uh, Google's got this hashtag Ghelp um, with, where, that people can use. And more and more people are turning to that because they can see that it's, they're getting good answers quickly and uh, very simply from Twitter. So our, the, tr the trick for us was really, uh, the tricky bit was creating those personas for clients, not for users. However, I'm very conscious that that's something that we were fortunate enough to have that pool of users to, to talk to early on. But I, I would argue that it will, all, it will almost always be harder for you to get time from someone who's corporate than someone who's passionate about something. Because you know, if, you're, if you've got a music app, you can find people who might be potential users. But no, how many CMOs do you know who would give you like an hour and a half of their time to be interviewed? You might know one, might know two, but do you know 10? That's, that was the challenge for us, and I'm assuming, and pretty sure it would be a, a, sort of a major challenge for anyone who's not part of a, a global company that has that kind of reach and can talk to other people. Just to follow up on that, were there assumptive personas that you then ended up with for the C-level, or did you actually get to speak to planning CMOs, CPOs, CTOs, etc.? So, Z did the personas, so again, stop me if I, if, when I start saying stupid stuff. But the, what, what we ended up doing is we ended up identifying the three main types of people that we want to talk to out of, I think, seven or eight that we identified as, as potentials. And then from there, we, what we did is we were lucky enough to have our previous relationships with people through other products that come social. So, for example, uh, because we've got, we also offer this, this um, agent support solution, we could say, hey, we know you're not using crowds and you might not be interested, but could we talk to you? And so it was, it was kind of hard, but we did manage to do that, and we've got uh, the um, proper personas, like really well researched and documented for, I think, it, I think it's three or four people. And yes, but again, we were building on something, so it would be tougher, and I'm not sure I'd have a good solution for you if you're starting without that kind of uh, pre-existing um, pool of people you can talk to. Sorry, um, too many questions. Um, two more last. Yeah. Um, at least for now. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you my card. Sure. That way you can, you can email me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, yeah. keep them coming. So, 
do you have like special set of dashboards, KPIs, where you say, okay, now you've started using it, these are the KPIs which you should measure, and this would prove success of our problem? Yeah, so we, we don't have a dashboard, but we do make a lot of, lot of data available directly through it, either through the API or through reports. And what we do is we make recommendations or they come to us with a clear idea of what they want. And then we say, well, based on what you think is useful, here are the KPIs that we suggest. Because we, we provide that kind of, uh, because some people are going to say, what's really important to me is the volume. So they say, we, had, we received 10,000 questions, we answered 5,000 of them through uh, crowds. Some people say, no, 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 what I want is first response time. And then I want to break it down like this and like that. And, I, and, this is, and some people want CSAT. Some people don't care about CSAT. So what we can do is we work out with people what they want to see, how they want to do it. And then we, we make it possible for them to get that information. And, and sometimes it, it, it happens that we do, not have, we do not currently track that because some people have really creative ideas. And usually, Chris, we, we, we make it possible to start tracking. So we say... We don't, if they say, we've got this idea, we don't know how to track it, we can say, well, here's how we would do it, and then we work together, and then we implement. And it's happened in the past where um, at one point um, people said, well, something that's really important to me, I don't care how many questions they answer, I want to know how much time they spend in app. Aren't actually doing stuff, not just no idling. Yeah. So we had to say, well, okay. Some people came to us saying, I don't care, I mean, I, I do care about how many questions are being answered, and how many questions we got. So let's say we got 10,000 questions and we answered 5,000, but did people see the other 5,000? So we need to track what people actually see. And we're like, okay, it makes sense, it's, it's cool stuff, but nobody before you had ever asked for it, so we had to, to work on that. So that's how we, as we go, we kind of build the, the, the number of things that people can track and that allows people to be a bit more creative. And it also kind of challenges us because we have to be we had to, to be able to demonstrate value in a variety of ways. And the last one. Um, what's your current like uh, lead time from like lead to closure for clients? Uh, I've got no idea. Um, we we talk to a lot of people and a lot of companies. Um, what, what happens is when we first reach out, they say this is cool, and then they, there's like a long period. Yeah. Where, they, where we don't know, we kind of like keep in touch and send stuff, but we're not, it's not that, that, we're not trying to close. And then usually it kind of goes like this. And we, there's a number of companies where, you know, when, when people tell me, hey, we know we've closed this gaming company, go, makes perfect sense. You know, and sometimes they say out of the left field, they'll go, oh, we signed that bank, the big bank with all the buildings. And you kind of go, what? Who, where, how? And that's, so it's, it, it is, but it kind of depends on, on because it, there's also a strong word of mouth, so people will just say hit and reach out. But again, then the, 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 um, once you start that conversation, the problem is the person who wants crowds is usually not the person who's got the checkbook. So that's the... Uh... Um, so then do you need, I mean, at times, like, help these guys who are actually needing the product but can't sign a checkbook like, mm. to build a business case okay. justification? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we kind of t what usually how it goes is we've got those personas that we talked about earlier, and we say usually the CMO will want to do see this and this and this and this. It, oh, your your boss is a CXO. Well, here's what we can do. And but once we've got that, what we can do is we can say, well, here's talk to your boss and kind of tell us what they want to see, and then if you don't know or you can't talk to them, we've got a bunch of solutions that we can suggest, and then we we support them. But we do pretty much every single time have to help them cross that line because at one point they're just going, they're going to be stuck most of the time and I think you have questions. I was just wondering about your your clients put a lot of trust in these experts yeah and it's potentially their brand at risk if the experts are as expert as they could be mm. is there an escalation process or something within the app there that raises particular problems up to the client yes so that's one of the questions that we get the most, is people say, you know, what happens if a user goes rogue? So there's two things that you need to consider. The first one is um, experts answer using their own Twitter account. 
and people on Twitter will never know. There's never any fake ones, is there, on Twitter? No, that's not what I mean. It's you choose who you let in. So some, some brands just say, here's the link, anyone can sign up, and that's it. Um, and some, some companies have literally 9,000 experts. Some companies uh, say only, it's like it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a club, you have to prove yourself and you will be let in and they know and trust those people. But in both cases, what happens is they sign up with their own personal Twitter account and crowds is completely invisible to anyone on Twitter. People on Twitter will never know that crowd exists. So what they see is someone who found their question from, and using their own Twitter handle to answer them. And if you want to be that rogue agent, you can do that exact same thing without crowds. If you want, you know, if you're if you're like a disgruntled user for whatever brand, you can go on Twitter, search for a couple of terms. It won't be as good as crowds, but you can do the exact same thing. So, because and because it's their account, your brand is not at risk. Not not, not more so than if if you, if some some guy on Twitter goes on a rant. And so that's the first thing. And we've never had uh, um, issues there. The second thing is. We did have that question, client said, uh, we, we had one client in particular who was very, very concerned about this. And so what we did is we added a functionality that's called report. So if you're a user, you can see all the other, all the other answers by users and you can just go through it really quick and there's a button that says basically report to admin, click, send something, and then the, the admin can intervene. But then again, they can, what they, they, pretty much the only thing they can do is kick the person out of the program, no, block their access and then take it up with the Twitter. Yeah. Having said that, we implemented it and it's been used, I think, three times. And one of those times is me testing the feature live. And that's across clients over two years. So there's no, nothing major there. The last bit is the, the companies who do use CSAT, it's kind of funny because they were majorly concerned about this. And CSAT was higher on crowds than on any of the other platforms. Because when you, if you look, you, let's say you've got a problem, and let's assume you're computer literate, your solutions right now would be you find the FAQ, assuming you know what things are called, and you do, don't just Google, what, why, does the th why is the thingy flashing? So if you can do that, you've got the FAQ, but it's really hard to find, and, and so on and so on. Or you can reach out to forums, but a lot of people find forums intimidating and they will, it takes some time and you need to find the right thing and it's time consuming. And so you've got all these other solutions or you're on Twitter and you kind of go, how does this work? Why is this broken? How do you do that? Which takes exactly five seconds from the comfort of Twitter and you get an answer that's in your language, that's immediate, the, the language is natural and you, d you do not have to step out of your comfort zone. And if you've got any follow-up questions, you, you've got a real human being, someone who's deeply knowledgeable about what, th what they're talking about, who's answering you. And one thing that's really, that was really fun is when we talk to clients, we realize that in a lot of companies, you've got employees asking questions to experts because the experts live and breathe those products and they know so much more than sometimes agents who might be very smart and very you know, proactive but they've only been there three months and they don't know how that old version works. So that comfort means that people are happy and you have, because they, you create that trust and the ecosystem, it's that I'm aware of, so I don't follow every account all the time, it's very rare for someone to go rogue and then basically just go like kicked and that's it. I was more actually thinking more about the person asking the question in the first place because some of the time it's going to be quite annoyed customers, I yeah. thought, as well. And Twitter is, again, known for rants and, mm. and if they don't get the answer that they want, is there a way... Oh, so, sorry, to escalate the question, yeah. I, I thought you meant to escalate the, 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 the violation. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, yes and no. So right now we are thinking about a, we don't, so right now what we do is experts will at mention uh, support and support know who the, the experts are so they can then go and have a look. One feature that we are, that is near the top of a backlog is called Escalate, where what you do is a question comes into crowds and, the, and an expert, uh, expert has a look and says it's a valid question, it's, but it's not something that I as an expert can answer. 
because <coughs> there's a question about a specific accounts or something. And we want them to be able to click and it goes to the right person in customer support. And because we offer that, that customer support solution as well, we can do crossover. Conversely, uh, another feature that's been requested by clients is a, a um, bump to agent, uh, to expert, because sometimes agents get questions, like someone will say, where's, where's, the, bu uh, where's the button for this? You don't have to be an agent to answer that. Anyone can answer that. But if, you, if your agent answers that question, because you have to pay the agents and all that, the cost for, per resolution will be $4 or something. If you, if you send it to an expert, the cost per resolution will be a quarter of that. So it is a feature. And sometimes also people say, I'm the agent, I quite frankly don't know. So I can either go and poke the expert, get that expert to give me the solution and then post it again, or I can basically just say, hey expert, can you please help this because I'm out of my depth. But no, so we don't have that feature yet. It's not built in as a, as a full-fledged feature. It is something that we're looking at. And right now the workaround is the app mentions from, uh, from users. Yeah, does that answer yeah. the question? Cool. In back. Yeah. As a product manager for your product, mm -hmm. how do you measure the value from the user and the customer? So, do you identify it in your business and powers? Did he, mm -hmm. So how say? basically how do we calculate cost per resolution? Is that is that the okay. is that how we how do we calculate cost per resolution? When I say that an, a, a resolution uh, through crowds is you no know, like a dollar something versus that much. Is that is that what you're asking? No, I, mean, I mean, how do you kind of like how do you balance your the value that the customer is getting from the app and also the value from the user? Because we have customers. Yeah. You have customers and you have clients. Yeah. And so how do you measure up of that value? So we don't. We. I mean, I think this might be one. I try not to, to use the word customer because usually the customer is someone who's in. Okay, yeah, so clients, we're talking about the, the company that starts the crowds program and has experts. Is, is that how do, we, how do we balance value between them and the users? Yeah. Um, users are not. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It does. It's just, so, it's just because I, I need to, to make sure that I understand the question to not repeat the, the prime work that we just had where I misunderstood. The. Um, Users don't, don't care about value, their value. They, they, they get something out of, uh, out of crowds, but they don't get a monetary uh, value. That's not true motivate them, I think. Like, apart from, know it all, that you've got that motivation. That, 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 I understand that some users spend 67 minutes daily. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so, like. so, users do not, do not consciously say, well, my, my, I'm worth this much. We can, if we want, we can, no, we can, we could take and like, you've answered this many questions, therefore, no, this is the value of what, of, of what you've done. But you could say, no, it's like, it's like asking, if you go to the RSPCA, how much is, is each volunteer worth? Like, kind of like reward, you know what I mean? There is a reward, the, but the reward is, depends it's, it's on a per client ba basis some clients like um like the big clients like google can afford to fly people places and no they, they never pay because you're not a paid employee that's very important but they might say you've done a cracking job here's the new pixel phone or if you're a video game company you might say oh we've got this new game here's the new game or this new expansion or this new this new that but it's a token of appreciation and that's because the users while they appreciate what they you know that token of appreciation it's just that it's not they're not being paid it's not a salary it's not people don't make a living from being a user it's just it's a tool for people who want to do what they do and it makes it easier for them so we we don't it's not something that has ever come up for us it's never been a problem we if you ask me like we could find a way of 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 um assessing what the the what each person has created, but it's not something that we've ever done because that's not how we look at it. Because how, after having talked to users, that's not how they look at it. And that relationship of potential rewards or tokens of appreciation is entirely between the client and and the users. We provide data if they want to see things and, and, th and that. Well, maybe I use, use app instead of reward. <laughs> but maybe after 
session. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yes, we, we can we can talk about it in a second. So I guess you can from slight value into some more measurable metrics, right? Because when it comes to the client side, I actually think about like you know how many clients actually use it and if they could use it. And equally if you're talking about users like experts, you can also like measure um, what's your engagement ratio, right? Like if the same people keep coming back. And also, like, you know, if your expert base keeps growing. That's what people like, yeah. So you can basically, like, uh, I'm getting right, so, like, think of how to, like, the constant value into something we can actually measure. And you can say that people find value if they use your product. Like, in what ads, like, what's experts and clients? Oh, so. You mean, how do we know if they're happy with the product and they, uh, they assign value to your product as opposed to their actions? Yeah, so no, so yes, yeah, so I, yeah, so that's what we, what we do is how active are people and how often? Because some people will have, and uh, some people will do this day in, day out. Some people spend like an hour every single day. Some people, you know, like two hours every second day. Some people just try it and then you no, know, never come back. So we, we do track all that and we can say, well, if this person is, is doing this, then it's that they find value in, in, in what we provide. There's a bunch of, th of features that we have also that we, where we can track what, they, what people are doing. So for example, some users used to be very um, active on forums. Some of them are still active on forums at the same level, but also do crowds. Some of them just you know, are not active on forums anymore at all and only do crowds. And some people just you know, there's, like, there's a bit of a balance. So that's where we can say, we can, de we can demonstrate that this person offered with this value proposition, no, had this value proposition and prefers this value proposition. And by returning, you prove that you're using it in a way that where we provide value to you, the user. Sorry, I misunderstood the question.